you, Stephen Sam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Audio okay? All right. Thanks for sticking with us through day one. Hope everybody's having a good time so far. And I know we're not butting up against anything. There's a happy hour after this, but uh, I think it starts at eight or something. So we won't go quite that long. Uh, with that introduction, we probably can skip over the first slide. You know the name of our talk here. It's some of the research that we did into hacking an industrial control system, specifically some building automation. Uh, for the who am I, my name is Steve Pavoni. As mentioned in the introduction, I'm the head of advanced threat research at Trellix. Uh, I also, the team, I think lovingly, maybe not lovingly, entitled me as the Excel guru. I think probably because I have the management title in my name, so I'm a lot, not allowed to do anything technical, I guess. Uh, but I can write a mean Excel function. But outside of that, uh, I do a lot of vulnerability root cause analysis. My background's in network security, uh, reverse engineering, exploitation. But this was really my first foray into hardware hacking, which uh, has Sam has a lot more experience in. Sam? Thanks, Steve. Yeah, my name is Sam Quinn. I'm a senior security researcher at Trellix. Um, Steve had a cool line that says he's the head of advanced threat research. So I wanted my bullet points to be the same length, so I'm the tail of it. The butt. Um, yeah, the butt. <laughs> I, uh, no one really, I self, uh, self, um, identify as elite hacker, hacksor. <laughs> uh, my core interest could have been summarized by just hacking in general, but, um, uh, I definitely like exploitation, hardware hacking for sure, um, embedded systems like IoT devices, and then like OS fundamentals and things like that. And when Sam and I are not uh, out finding crashes, crashes are out finding us. We're both av avid bikers, as you can tell here. Uh, these are actual videos of us both crashing. I will say the only common denominator is that Sam was with me on the trip in the right. So. Because you can't even ride the trail I was on. Well, neither can you, clearly. <laughs> Anyways, let's talk about how we uncovered this target, why we went after uh, access control specifically. And because we're at Hardware I.O., we're going to spend a lot more time talking about hardware at Black Hat. We're going to spend a little bit more time talking about the vulnerabilities themselves, but you'll get a good taste for what we found as well. So a little bit of a 60-40 there. We look back over the last couple of years at some of the escalation of the geopolitical uh, cyber scene, the warfare targeting industrial control system, building automation systems. Obviously, we've seen attacks against things like gas and oil pipelines, water treatment, telecom, the energy grid going back nearly a decade or more. But access controls not only for us represented kind of that transition from the physical to digital space, uh, but it was also that single point of failure and very little research has been done in the area of access control, and it serves as one of those uh, really powerful boundaries that, that attackers still uh, can, can, can gain access to. So that brings us to the target. This is the Linnell S2 Mercury board. I know it's a, a mouthful, but the board itself here is an access control panel, a dual reader controller. Uh, it's, it's hard to miss, as you can see, bright red. And it's manufactured by a company called Mercury, which is HID Global, but has a sticker on it that's Linnell S2. And Linnell is part of the global HVAC company carrier that everybody's probably familiar with. Now, I put a lot of time into this slide, as you can see. This is one of the most, you know, proud diagrams we've ever put together here. But this simple representation is just the board and its usual deployment, which is it manages a number of card readers or controllers. I think this one supports up to 64 independent card readers downstream, but you can daisy chain them together to support an infinite number of readers or uh, in any kind of relay. They're typically deployed on the local network. You don't see a lot of these internet connected unless it's uh, probably a misconfiguration but it's possible. And they're managed by a software called OnGuard through Linnell, which is the management software that does all the provisioning of badges and access control and users. And it just tells the board what to do. The board's just a dumb relay uh, in inputs and outputs. The other thing that caught our attention for this, and it might be a little hard to read, I don't know how good your eyes are, but we, we, we saw a statement, a marketing statement that came out uh, a couple of years ago for this board saying that specifically the 4420 we're looking at had been uh, uh, following rigorous security vulnerability interop testing had been approved for use in government facilities. Well, of course, for us as security researchers, we get the, the finger licking moment, right? Uh, licking the chops here. And, and this was probably the most enticing part of going after the board for us. 
says, hey, this is government certified. What does that actually mean? And uh, a spoiler alert, it's it's not a whole lot. Uh, furthermore, we found out in the process that the board was not just uh, certified for use in government facilities, but also added to the APL, which is the approved product list, meaning a government can go look in that data sheet or that list, pick a product, and it has been, as we saw, rigorously tested, uh, maybe not as much. To acquire the target originally, we went on our boomer-friendly marketplace eBay and and bought this device, uh, fifteen hundred bucks or something. Uh, we did not manage it with the OnGuard software at first; that came much later in the process, and it really didn't end up being that essential to actually uh, hacking the device. So Sam's going to talk uh, to you guys a little bit about some of the hardware steps, and then we'll 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 finish uh, talking through the the discoveries that we found as well. Absolutely, thanks, Steve. So um, the next. This whole talk, I guess, will be mostly kind of our process looking into researching it. Um, and we really wanted to focus on the hardware stuff here. So this could be a review for some of you experts out there. But we wanted to dive into a lot of the, the parts and components and how we approach this ourselves. So um, the first thing we did <laughs> was um, when we get the board, the first thing we like to do is start looking at all of the components, the CPU, and try to start doing some OS int and recon on those devices by trying to look up data sheets, things like that, get pinouts and and things that you can potentially use later on down the road. We're also looking for simple um, I.O. ports that we can connect to. Um, like Joe Grant said in the keynote this morning, um, you know, the, the path of least resistance is what the hackers always like to do. So that's what we're trying to find out here, is trying to find where these ports are and try to identify them a little bit. So uh, as just like any experienced, experienced traveler knows exactly where their towel is, an experienced hacker knows exactly where the UART is. Um, and that's what we kind of identified this potential four pin output as being. Um, four pins usually kind of relates to what a UART looks like. And then there was also this nice 20 pin port on the device, which uh, kind of could be, could be a potential JTAG. So um, at this point, we're still just rudimentary poking around with a multimeter, trying to identify what things are ground, what things are you know power. Um, that can help narrow down what the scope of these ports could be. But really, the main way of trying to figure out what kind of um, data is being transmitted over these ports is using something like a logic analyzer. And that's exactly what we did here. So when we hooked up those four, that potential UART connection to the logic analyzer and then booted up the device, you can see that one of the pins, this one up at the top, was um, obviously getting some data. Um, so that was exciting. So we knew that that is probably serial UART. And <laughs> unlike Steve, he can actually read fluent hex. I don't know. It's like the weirdest thing. Useless he, too. Yeah. He got really excited about this because he's like, that says ROM boot. But to me, I didn't know. But so uh, that was great. So now we do know that we do have, you know, async serial data being sent over this wire. And that is exactly when we ran into our first roadblock. So this screenshot was the last moment in time that data was being transmitted over the UART. Um, and it's kind of in an arbitrary spot. Like you can see some services have already started, but eventually it just halted. Um, it was printing out quite a few messages per second, and then it just went uh, dead silent. So we knew that it was getting disabled somewhere, and most likely in software, because if it was disabled in hardware, we wouldn't have seen anything, obviously. So our approach to re-enabling the UART was to try to overwrite the init variable from the bootloader. And this is how the Linux kernel starts up. Um, and if we can overwrite any init variables um, or the init scripts with our own script, like bin sh, it wouldn't disable the UART because none of that code is running. Um, so then our next step was trying to find where that script is. This is just a sneak preview of the script that eventually we found. Um, you can see in the, the comment there, it says, Disabled, disable the serial port if it's currently enabled. And that's why we probably saw some messages being printed across, because it was enabled, and then it figured it out and disabled it later on. So this is the script that we wanted to find and try to comment it out. One of the other things with that level of access by changing the init variable is that we could potentially change the root password and use the UART console just as if we were logging into the Linux operating system normally. And then as a bonus, dump the entire firmware and start analyzing some of the system binaries um, manually offline. And this is exactly when we ran into Roadblock 2 when we were trying to change that init variable. And I'll let Steve cover that. Yeah, thanks, Sam. So 
what you'll see, I'm going to advance the slide here, and you can see kind of uh, part of the U-boot process here. One of the strings we called out says hit keys to stop auto boot. You've probably seen something similar. There's typically a timer that counts down from three, two, one, zero, giving the user time to, to input a keyboard keystroke and halt the boot process. For us, it was hard coded statically to zero, and so that was why we were unable to have interactive commands to the U-boot shell. Um, so since we had that JTAG port that Sam talked about earlier, what we figured here is it'd be a little bit easier to actually modify the running system using JTAG instead of trying to dump a modified system image and then, then reflashing it back to the device. So that's our next approach here. So try to use UG, uh, JTAG. So we figured out exactly why this variable was set. If we look at the, uh, the documentation for U-boot, we can see that the boot delay variable, which is that zero that was set, uh, means if it's set to zero, it can prevent you from interact uh, entering interactive commands again forever. Well, forever is a very short time in our world. Just below that, you can see that if you set the variable to negative one, it'll disable auto boot. So our goal was to actually patch that value out from zero to negative one. So as a recap, our approach here, leverage JTAG to dump the bootloader image. We'll try to reverse engineer the U-boot image to find out where that boot delay variable is checked. And then we'll use something like J-Link to insert a breakpoint just before that check is done, patch it out from zero to negative one and go. And that's exactly what we did. So let's look back at that 20 pin candidate on the board. This is a close up shot of our JTAG. We also could have used something like Joe Grand's JTagulator. You probably saw that in the uh, keynote this morning. Unfortunately, it just wasn't nearly pink enough for our purposes. So we needed something with a little more color and we chose the Seger J-Link. So this, this beautiful device here is uh, uh, simple. It comes with software. It comes with a pinout. So you can determine like we just went on the, the Seger website and got the 20 pin pinout for JTag here. Uh, for our purposes, we went through and tested the ground pins all were on the right side. We checked that the 5 volt supply was indeed getting 5 volts through a multimeter and by powering it with a power supply. You can also YOLO the approach and just randomly plug stuff in and eventually you're going to get there, but you might do some, some damage to the underlying components that way. As a, a snapshot of what our typical wiring project looks like, this is our actual cabinet in our data center attached to our lab uh, versus the one immediately next door to us. So this is how our projects are typically wired. This one was absolutely no different. We followed the Doc Octopus model and got everything uh, wired up here. But this is the JTAG after all those 20 pins or the right pins are connected here. Uh, we did include a little uh, Oregon area uh, brew there, the Ninkasa brew as a shout out to where we're from. But uh, that set us up to do the software analysis. You can download the J-Link software directly from Seger's website. And the way that it works is it essentially, once it runs, it's waiting for the CPU to establish a connection. And once it makes that connection, then you can provide it with some inputs here. Now, Sam, uh, what you'll see here, Sam put together this little J-Link XE script. Uh, it, we give it the device ID, which is the Atmel CPU. The rest of the parameters, we didn't even bother to really look into. We just took defaults from a script we found online. But most importantly, is the option to set a custom script at the end there. Now, we're not typically in the habit of sharing exploit scripts or anything that could enable the adversary. In this case, we're going to make a little bit of an exception here and share this. So um, in three, two, one. Yes, that's right. Sam wrote an entire script with the letter H in it uh, to halt the CPU. So you know you're efficient as an engineer when the name of the script is 11 times longer than the contents itself. Regardless, it was very effective in giving us a halt or a setting an automatic breakpoint whenever we ran that. And we could use this to... Uh, to debug where the boot delay was set. So let's go on to dumping the image here. We had a, a very good idea of where the bootloader, the U-boot image was being loaded because during the bootstrap process, you can see here, uh, there are 80,000 bytes copied from the address of 20,000 to 73F000000. So we knew the size and from where and to whence it was being copied. And that gave us the ability to use another command from JLink, which is the save bin or save binary command. Uh, yes, they're very creative at, at naming, to take a copy of that U-boot image for analysis. And that's exactly what we did. The next thing was to open a debugger, something like, uh, or a disassembler, something like IDA, where we could look into this image that we have and actually find uh, the, the strings of interest and find that boot delay variable. So you know, obviously all elite hackers, the first thing they do is run strings on the binary. And uh, we were looking for that hit keys to stop auto boot. Uh, and of course, it was found in the binary. That gave us a ROM address here. 
Uh, and the reason we don't have a, I guess I'll back up for a second and say, Ida didn't do a great job of processing this file because it doesn't know what it is. It's just a raw binary. It doesn't know if it's an elf or a PE or uh, whatever. And so we have to do a little bit of code cleanup, function declaration and definition, uh, defining offsets. And that's really what we're trying to do here in addition to just finding that boot delay variable. So anyways, we found this ROM address, followed that. And obviously that took us uh, to the pointer to where the string was. Then we had to, because we couldn't cross-reference and IDA didn't have context for cross-references here, we used that value as an immediate value to look up in IDA. And that gave us the location of where it was found. When we double clicked on that, it took us here. Now, I may read printable hex ASCII, which is again that useless skill of coming from writing IPS signatures for too long, but I don't read hex ARM assembly opcodes, so, um, so we, we had no idea what this was. We used the shortcuts in IDA P uh, and F to define the functions and procedures, uh, and after doing that, we got a much cleaner view. This is obviously the graph format view of the, where our string was being referenced. More importantly, right after the pointer to that string address is a function str2l, which I'm sure you guys know is a string to long. Now, this is actually a wrapper for str2l. We just named it that way. But that makes a lot of sense because that's probably an ASCII value for that boot delay being checked, converted into a long, and then processed in the, in the boot process. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what we want to do is set a breakpoint just before this function call and do that analysis. So here is our set breakpoint command. You'll see the first thing we did is we took that address just before the stir to long. And the, the only argument to that function, it comes from R0. And R0 is actually that value which has the boot delay. So if we dump the memory at that address and just take two bytes, we can see that it is actually uh, hard coded there to the little endian value of 0, 30, right? Which is ASCII 0. Then we use the W2 or write two byte commands to write negative one or uh, 2D31 to that, to that value. And after that, we can just hit go to continue and all of a sudden now we've, we've patched that uh, boot delay variable. So just to kind of recap the process, we're gonna show a little video here. I'll set the stage for what you just saw. We're gonna kind of repeat it in video format. The left side of the screen is going to be the device and, and the, the boot up process. On the right side is our JTAG connection from the attacker's laptop. And the first thing that we're gonna do is run Sam's really awesome super elite script here. And it'll wait for the processor to uh, connect and we check if it's halted. And sure enough, the CPU is halted at this point. So we can continue on by setting a breakpoint here, right? Again, that's the breakpoint right before that stir to L is checked and hit go and the boot process continues. And it does take a, a minute or so to hit our breakpoint. But when we hit the breakpoint, what we'll do at that point is make sure that the CPU is halted again, running the same command and that it did stop at the breakpoint that we expect it to. And we can see that, sure enough, it did stop at the breakpoint that we expected, and now we can do that inline patch. So here is where we're going to dump the two bytes of memory. We see that ASCII uh, hex 30, which is our zero. We use the write two command to write 2D negative one, uh, and then we just hit go. And what you'll see is as soon as we hit go here, if you watch the left side, it's almost instantaneous how quickly it drops you into that U-boot shell. And from U-boot shell, then we can actually do things like help and run those commands. But more importantly, we can now set the arguments that Sam talked about earlier, which is overwriting the init scripts with bin sh and getting us a true root shell on the device. So that was the command that you might have missed just earlier there is setting the boot arguments and the init uh, script and overwriting it. And now we actually run a who am I and we actually have a, a full root shell on the device. So that's a great place uh, for us to continue. We were able to, you know, from a root shell, obviously this is a, a great leverage point to do further research and look at the system binaries. Down the road a little further, we ran into another roadblock, which is our roadblock three here, and that was the hardware-based watchdog timer. So as we were doing, as we were enabling breakpoints and hitting them, we would find that about every 15 seconds or so, the system would reboot. And this made a lot of sense because there's a watchdog timer with a 15 second interval. So our approach to disabling that was very similar. We wanted to find out how did the developers intend for the, the watchdog to be enabled or disabled. Uh, if we could use that, we would pause the CPUs using the same script and overwrite uh, the watchdog timer values and then validate that it was disabled. 
So if we look at the Atmel data sheet, Sam talked a little bit about the OSINT process earlier on and the importance of, of you know, using data sheets and documentation. We, able, we were able to find very quickly the register that controls the watchdog timer and the specific bit here, which is the WDDIS bit, that if it's zero, it enables it. If it's one, uh, it disables it. So obviously that was the change we wanted to make. A little further down in the data sheet, we could see the address of where the watchdog timer mode register is loaded and more importantly, the access. So it's a read, write, once register. That's a mouthful. But what that means is if the CPU or user or anyone modifies either read or write from that register at any point, it's then disabled indefinitely from that point on until we reboot. So we knew that we had to pause or break point before that register was ever touched in any way. And then again, the 15th bit here you'll see is that WDDIS. So when we patch this out, we'll be working on the second byte of a D word or the 15th bit. As we watch the boot up, we'll see that the that this is actually the watchdog timer mode register value. So the, the, the register address that we saw before up here is actually pointing to that, and the value is right here. And by if you recall, the second byte here, that 2F is the one that has the 15th bit. That's what we wanted to modify. So again, very similar commands here. We take the memory at that address and one byte further in. So instead of ending in 44, right, we go to 45 for the second byte. That's a 2F. And obviously, we want to change that, the leading bit or the 15th bit from a 0 to a 1. That changes 2F to AF. And that gives us our actual patch. And by hitting go, we continue in the which watchdog timers disabled and we thought that was cool af be here all week actually i'm leaving tonight okay so we do see the d word is now actually modified the second byte for some reason it actually modified all four bytes we went back and tried to figure it out couldn't come up with any reason why after modifying one byte it changed the whole thing didn't matter it achieved our purposes we can see the watchdog timers disabled and then later on when the binaries were trying to access the watchdog timer they had no context of it and of course they threw errors as well so this got us to where we needed to be Okay, so that's a lot of work just to begin analysis. We've accomplished literally nothing useful except giving us a jumping off point. But it did give us a great place to start uh, software hacking. And Sam could take over for that for a while. I know. Don't leave yet. <laughs> um, I know we're here all for you know, hardware and stuff. But there is some cool stuff here. So um, the first thing that we, we want to do is try to find the most impactful um, attack vectors. And obviously, as we all know, remote attack vectors are juicy. So uh, doing a, a simple nmap scan, we can see that the this access control board is actually indeed running a whole web server. And then it had another listening port that we eventually found out later is how it communicates with the OnGuard software. But look, browsing to the... Um, the web server that it's running on the device, we noticed that it had a full login page, and we'll show you just how uh, impactful that is later. But um, it was pretty impressive to see that it's doing like cookie validation. There's users, accounts, and stuff all built into just this little device. However, none of the badge or door access control uh, like settings were managed through this. So this was pretty much a web server meant to get the device provisioned and set up on the network for the first time and things like that. So this is like the network settings that you can see where it's um, you can set up like DNS and IP addresses and things like that. Really nothing to do with badge management or anything. But um, we did notice from this um, that a lot of the user inputs had restricted characters and things like that. So it got us kind of curious into... Uh, why they want those characters so restricted. And that could be because all of the websites, um, or all those pages, were dynamically created in CGI bin files. And so if you're unfamiliar, CGI bins are compiled, in this case, C code, that dynamically create web pages and whatnot. Um, and when we interact with them, they all run as root. So <laughs> us logging into the login page, you can see it is running as root. So this is exciting. Um, if we can find any vulnerabilities in these CGI files, we could potentially have, we don't even have to escalate our privileges at all. And um, to, the little cherry on top, all of these binaries were compiled with symbols. So looking at them in IATA Pro, um, <laughs> you don't have to even guess what the functions do. You can just read the function name. So that was also really, um, really great. So this is when we started to actually start hunting for system calls and try to get potential command injections. Um, because we already know that we don't have to 
escalate our privileges. If we can get any code to arbitrary code to execute from those CGI bin files, we would already have root access. So looking for a system, you know, the, the call to system, uh, we found that it was wrapped by Merck system for some reason, but um, uh, whatever. <laughs> and uh, the uh, entire list here, I don't expect you to read it. I just wanted to show you the length. Um, X refing that Merck system, there was a handful and, and plus three handfuls, I would say, <laughs> um, uh, size of the system calls where all of these could be potential um, targets for us. So that's what we started to look at. However, if you're familiar with command injections and format string vulnerabilities and things like that, not all of them are created equal. So you can see, for instance, this call to system has a static um, argument here where there's no user input. So this is kind of boring. Um, so we did go through a handful of these until we found one like this next one um, that does take user input. So like we saw in the web page, we actually can control uh, the host name and then um, you know, that if we can control that from a uh, attacker's perspective, when it goes down here and reads the uh, with the format string with SN printf into this this uh, variable and then calls Merck, Merck system, that could be a potential command injection. So this really got our attention going. Um, but like we said before, now that we know where the input's coming from, we had to go back to the original, how do we bypass these character restrictions that they claim? Um, and this was another kind of a hold my beer, I got this moment. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, we, we got into it. Um, and the first layer of blacklisting that we identified was the client side. And this was done in JavaScript where you can pretty much directly see that this valid character string list one-to-one -one lines up with um, pretty much that, that uh, the blacklisting shown above. So that was interesting. And then the back end also had some character back, uh, blacklisting as well through this XXS, XSS string test. Um, while we're not trying to do a cross-site scripting attack, a lot of these characters that you see in this list here are still very useful for command injections like the forward slash, the ampersand, and the semicolon, and things like that. So what we did is tried it out. We started with this simple command injection. We wanted to see if the device would sleep for 10 seconds, for instance. So over the browser, of course, the JavaScript kicks in and tells you that it contains illegal characters and doesn't even post the data to the, the backend CGI script or the, the CGI binary. Um, however, if you use curl, no JavaScript runs. So <laughs> you can see that we did get some of our command. We get the sigil opening parentheses, and a sleep. However, it seemed to get truncated on the space. So space wasn't a part of any of those characters that we saw being blacklisted from that XS, XSS string test. However, we found out later that the post data, um, like the, the parsing of the post data, um, would split on either an equals... 3D. Here, yeah, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, equals or space. So 20. Um, that's what we, we had to get around to. However, the Linux command or Linux interpreter, you know, for the shell does not, um, care if it's a space or any other white space character. So in, for this instance, what's actually highlighted in red there is a tab. So that seemed to be just fine. It got past all of those, um, blacklisting and we were able to inject this entire command into the, uh, host name. And we'll walk through exactly how that um, that uh, host name command injection works here. It is actually important to point out that this whole command that is highlighted here actually only ran at boot. So um, originally, we're hoping to get an instantaneous command injection. However, the host name does not get refreshed until a new um, like the new boot up cycle. And most importantly, it's also during when the device is trying to get an IP address early on in the network stack startup. So if we look at actually the reason why we nest another one is that we want to actually have an IP address for subsequence two. For this second command to work, we already we have to have some kind of networking set up. So um, we nest the first one in subsequence one, and then subsequence two is now just pulling commands um, directly from a uh, local 
in this case, this is our laptop's IP address. So it's just pulling commands from a web server there and then piping it directly into Ash. And the beauty of that is we can now bypass all of the command blacklisting that we saw, or the character blacklisting that we saw earlier because it's not going through any of that stuff. And you can see if we actually just curl, like wget it, our local host that's running this server, um, it prints out this whole SOCAT reverse shell um, interpreter. And there is forward slashes, commas, ampersands, all the stuff that we, we like again um, back, back in our command. So um, I'll let uh, Steve kind of walk you through the impact of that. All right, so that ended up being the first CVE filed. You may have seen it at the top of the slides there. But at this point, to us, it was just an authenticated command injection, which is is kind of boring. So we decided to look into how authentication was being handled or mishandled. And uh, that's what we're going to cover now. So cookie validation or session management is typically done by in a centralized method applied the same way to all of the CGI pages. However, in this case, the developers did it on a per CGI basis, and they did it differently for almost every single one of them for some reason, which was hilarious and, and really led to some failures. Uh, ultimately, what we did is we curled here uh, our, our command injection attack, and we just added a bogus session ID of 1337.1337. Obviously, this should not be a valid session cookie, uh, and it's not. And what we'll see, that's a post request. What we'll see here is that the JavaScript returns a timeout and an error. So it looks like it fails from the front end. But on the back end or on the console, I should say, the debug messages show that the network data actually was applied before the, they process that session cookie. So you can just issue these commands completely unauthenticated if you're using a post uh, versus a get, and it'll still run all the network commands before failing authentication. So this was kind of funny The developers had just completely mailed it in on, on post requests, pun intended. So that gave us now an unauthenticated command injection. But ultimately, as Sam mentioned, we still had to wait for the device to reboot. And we're very, very impatient people. So we wanted to next find a way to force the device to reboot so that we could uh, trigger that command injection hostname to load uh, at will. That brought us to the filing of the second CVE out of eight, which is our firmware upload buffer overflow vulnerability. When we started poking at some of the more recent firmware updates, we found that there was a diagnostic menu here that allowed you to load a file, a firmware file, and push it to the device. But more importantly, it said, hey, this will reboot the board. And that's exactly what we're looking for. So it looked pretty good. So the first thing that we did uh, is we, we tried to load a file, but we saw when we were looking at the developer tools and the network data that the cookie validation was actually being done right for this page, at least on the front end. So when we looked at the JavaScript and the HTML uh, iframes, so it was properly handing session uh, handling session management for this page. However, if you just navigate directly to the CGI update file that's running behind this, it skips the login process completely. So there's no authentication done whatsoever, and you can now upload files unauthenticated to the device. So uh, just com complete joke at this point. We kind of almost couldn't believe it. So the first thing we did is we took a random file, foobar.txt, empty file, and we just tried to upload it to the device. Sure enough, it went through and started installing. Um, as a side note, it also did some client-side checking to see if it was 15 megs or larger, but it did it wrong. We were able to bypass that by modifying the JavaScript. Won't go into details on that. Uh, ultimately, the package failed here, and we got this error that said the package signature is invalid, which is interesting because it tells us it has an invalid signature size. That kind of triggered a thought for us that maybe it's grabbing the size from the file, like uh, uh, statically or uh, versus dynamically building or counting the bytes. And in fact, that's exactly exactly what it was doing. So if I can draw your attention to bullet point one here, when we look at what's happening in the code behind this processing the firmware update, we have a file open or an F open, and that gets pushed to, uh, to update file. Just above it, there's a static size buffer malloc tier of 190 hex bytes, and that is where the file is going to get pushed to. Then what it does is it does an F seek or a file seek to get to the end of the file right here. 
And it actually pulls the last three ASCII bytes from the file signature to determine what the, the size is. Shortly after that, you'll see another stir to L where it converts those three uh, ASCII bytes to a long, and those then become the size that is used here to, uh, to read into the file and to write to the buffer. So this is our, we, we, we were able to find this statically and see that this was definitely going to be a buffer overflow. So this is now a valid firmware file, and you can see the last hex 158 bytes here are an ASCII value an ASCII blob of base64 encoded data that represents the file signature. But most importantly, the last three bytes, as we talked about, specify the size of that signature, and that is where it is parsing it from. So instead of programmatically parsing the size of the update file and passing that to the buffer, instead they allow user input because obviously we control the file that's being uploaded and whatever values are there. So exploiting the buffer overflow, we created a huge firmware file with uh, a, a uh, increasing pattern, just like you'd see in like a Metasploit pattern creation, so that we knew what was being overwritten or or modified or smashed. And obviously, we set the last uh, we set the size to nine 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 nine. It's over nine thousand. Uh, so we we unfortunately we didn't get we didn't need it all, but we didn't get all of that copied in. But because it truncates uh, the last three bytes, it takes the full size here of nine nine nine, converts it to that long, and uses it in the file read and. Uh, we then realized after that, shortly later, there's a branch instruction that references the register R3. And so we're going to hit this branch no matter what. And R3, if you look, has our pattern data. So DAVU comes from the pattern that we pushed into the firmware file. So we knew that we could arbitrarily branch to whatever location we wanted to by replacing that pattern with just a pointer. And we chose to replace it with a pointer to reboot. Now, you're probably thinking, why didn't we do wrap chaining and gadgets and get full remote code execution? We could have, probably. We looked at a lot of the gadgets for ROP uh, techniques. They were pretty ugly. They were not real conducive to what we wanted to do. And ultimately, we knew that we could achieve our, purchase, our pur purpose by just chaining together this arbitrary reboot with our command injection from before and achieve full RCE unauthenticated anyway. So this may be an exercise for later if we get uh, interested in creative, but, uh, but we had our full RCE. So we're only going to cover the two of these eight vulnerabilities today. We ended up submitting eight zero-day vulnerabilities to Carrier Linnell. Uh, the two that we covered today have a base score of 9 and 10.0, 10, 10 obviously being the highest CVSS score possible. Uh, it is authentic unauthenticated uh, command injection. And there have been patches uh, created for all of these except for one. I believe it's actually coming out tomorrow is what I've heard, uh, the latest update. It is uh, an authenticated command injection, uh, which helps a little bit because they, they will have to be logged in to exploit that. The rest of these do have patches available. As we looked further uh, in the research process and talking with uh, the manufacturer and the, and the board vendor, we found out that not just the 4420 we looked at was vulnerable, but all of these other panels as well, including their flagship and, and most common panels that they use worldwide. And furthermore, as recently as yesterday, I had a conversation with the board manufacturer and they said, yes, any OEM partner that uses these boards is also vulnerable. So it doesn't just extend to Linnell. It's every single OEM partner that uses the Mercury board. So they've been working with them for, for some time here. Uh, we don't know what the scope or scale of that is. I do know there was an article from a few years ago that said that uh, Mercury has tens of thousands of sites worldwide. Uh, they have uh, ownership with the uh, or partnerships with the vast majority of the Fortune 100 companies. So there's a huge install base for these devices. So last but not least, Sam's going to take us home with some exploitation, and we'll finish off with a demo showing you what we're able to ultimately accomplish. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And so one of the, the things that we always do on our advanced threat research team is try to bring it full circle and actually make um, a full proof of concept that could be used you know, out in the wild and show how these vulnerabilities could be um, uh, used. So of course, hacking the planet. Um, the first thing we want to do is find out how the control board is actually interacting with the door locks, so how the relays are triggered for those door locks. Uh, we wanted to create malware. Um, <laughs> sounds sounds uh, you know bad, but uh, yeah, create malware. Then we wanted to try to force the door to either unlock without having a badge or a valid badge in that case. Or, and then also try to keep the door locked. Like that could be a um, fun mental exercise if you could think of how to use that. Um, then we also wanted to try to hide from the monitoring software. All good malware 
shouldn't, you know, people shouldn't see you out there. So we wanted to try to hide from the on guard server, which we didn't really cover here, but um, security uh, guards and whatnot would be able to see if the door has been unlocked or opened, forced opened, um, things like that. We wanted to hide all of that. So it looks like the door has never been touched. Um, so with those symbols that we mentioned earlier, <laughs> we searched for relays and found how to trigger all of the door relays. Um, and they were simple as just in a simple ioctal call where um, uh, it, you pass the file descriptor for whatever relay you want to control in a simple parameter, if in this case, F003, um, the unlock and lock, they would have different parameters, but essentially the same call. And the uh, I'll show you exactly what happened next. Um, there won't be audio, but you can see a little LED flashing, hopefully. <laughs> so the, uh, the LED that's flashing on D17 there, that was us trying to unlock the door, and there was some monitoring process that we were fighting with that really wanted to keep the door locked. So uh, instead of going about and actually figuring out how to do it properly, um, we just wrapped it in a while loop and called it every millisecond. <laughs> And that kept the door unlocked as long as we wanted, so uh, or locked in that in that case. So this really um, was uh, uh, how we we did it, and kind of a really cool little piece of malware that we created. Super super simple, um, just really calling their kernel kernel driver to unlock the relays. It's probably worth stating uh, for the record, in case we didn't say it, we never release any exploit code malware. <laughs> this is all for internal demo purposes. So yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so uh, finally, we'll, we'll leave you with a demo here. Uh, Steve and I couldn't come down all the way to California without leaving us our uh, Hollywood audition tape. So um, please reach out with your uh, agents to, to hire us later. So we'll start the video here. Hey Sam. Yeah, I'm at the east entrance. Can you hack the brain trust room? Okay, thanks. All right, well, we want to thank everybody for coming today. Again, we're going to be talking more about the rest of the vulnerabilities in detail at Black Hat on the software side of things. Uh, hopefully, this is interesting. We'll stick around for a while if anybody has any questions. But thank you so much. Do we have any questions? Okay. So, um, uh, you boot, uh, you change the code, so there was no secure boot, or was that just for your development board where you, when you were trying stuff? Uh, so let me make sure I got that right. There was, you were asking if there was any secure boot on the U boot? Yeah, because you changed some parameters and. Uh, yep. Uh, so booted. no, yeah, there was, other than, I think they just assumed the, um, the setting it to zero you disabled the U boot uh, interactive console, so I don't think they took any further security measures. So when we, changed the init variable, it just, yeah, worked. <laughs> Any other questions? 
Okay. I think that should be it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you.